Friedrich Ebert was a German politician of the Social Democratic Party of Germany and the first president of Germany from 1919 until his death in office in 1925. Ebert was elected leader of the SPD on the death of August Bebel, and the SPD later became deeply divided because Ebert led it to support war loans for World War I. A moderate Social Democrat, Ebert was in favor of the Bergfrieden in which domestic political squabbles were put aside and all forces in society were expected to support the war effort. He tried to isolate those in the party opposed to the war but could not prevent a split. Ebert was a pivotal figure in the German Revolution of 1918-19. When Germany became a republic, he was its first chancellor. His policies at this time were primarily aimed at restoring peace and order and at containing the more extreme elements of the revolutionary left. For this he allied himself with conservative and nationalistic political forces, in particular with the leadership of the military under General Wilhelm Groener and the right-wing Freie Korps. With their help, Ebert's government crushed a number of leftist uprisings that were pursuing goals that were similar to those of the SPD. This has made him a controversial historical figure. Early Life Ebert was born in Heidelberg on February 4, 1871 as the fourth of six children of the tailor Karl Ebert and his wife Katharina. Although he wanted to attend university, this proved impossible due to the lack of funds of his family. He thus trained as a saddle maker from 1885 to 1888. After he had become a journeyman in 1889 he traveled, according to the German custom, from place to place in Germany seeing the country and learning fresh details of his trade. In Mannheim, he was introduced by an uncle to the Social Democratic Party and joined the party in 1889. Although Ebert studied the writings of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, he was less interested in ideology than in practical and organizational issues that would improve the lot of the workers then and there. Ebert was on the black list of the police due to his political activities, so he kept changing his place of residence. Between 1889 and 1891 he lived in Kassel, Braunschweig, Elberfeld Barmen, Remyid, Quackenbrough One Quarter CK and Bremen, where he founded and chaired local chapters of the Sattlerver Band. After settling in Bremen in 1891, Ebert made a living doing odd jobs. In 1893, he obtained an editorial post on the socialist Bremer Bar One Quarter Tung. In May 1894, he married Louise Rump a manual laborer, who had been employed as a housemaid and in labeling boxes and who was active in union work. He then rented a pub which became a center of socialist and union activity and was elected party chairman of the Bremen SPD. In 1900, Ebert was appointed a trade union secretary and elected a member of the Bremer Bar One Quarter Registraft as representative of the Social Democratic Party. In 1904, Ebert presided over the National Convention of the Party in Bremen and became better known to a wider public. He became a leader of the moderate wing of the Social Democratic Party and in 1905 Secretary General of the SPD, at which point he moved to Berlin. At the time, he was the youngest member of the Parteiver stand. Meanwhile, Ebert had run for a Reichstag seat several times in constituencies where the SPD had no chance of winning, 1898 better, 1903 and 1906 stayed. However, in 1912, he was elected to the Reichstag for the constituency of Elberfeld Barmen. This was the election which also made the SPD the strongest party in the Reichstag with 110 out of a total of 397 members, surpassing the Zentrum. On the death of August Bebel in 1913, Ebert was elected on September 20 as joint party chairman of the convention in Gina with 433 out of 473 votes. His co-chairman was Hugo Haas. World War I, when the Julie Cries of 1914 erupted, Ebert was on vacation. After war was declared in early August, Ebert traveled to Zurich with party treasurer Otto Braun and the SPD's money to be in a position to build up a foreign organization if the SPD should be outlawed in the empire. He returned on August 6 and led the SPD Reichstag members to vote almost unanimously in favor of war loans, accepting that the war was a necessary patriotic, defensive measure, especially against the autocratic regime of the Tsar in Russia. In January 1916, Haas resigned. 
the party's stance and participation in the Bergfrieden, under the leadership of Ebert and other moderates like Philip Skederman, in favor of the war with the aim of a compromise peace, eventually led to a split, with those radically opposed to the war leaving the SPD in early 1917 to form the USPD. For similar reasons, Ebert had ended the parliamentary union with several left-wing members of parliament and started to work closely with the Zentrum and the Progress Party in 1916. Later those kicked out by Ebert called themselves Spartacists. Since 1916, Ebert shared the leadership of the Reichstag delegates with Skederman. Although he was against a policy of territorial gains by military conquest, Ebert supported the war effort which he saw as a defensive struggle. Ebert experienced the traumatic loss of having two of his four sons killed in the war. Heinrich died in February 1917 in Macedonia. Georg was killed in action in May 1917 in France. In June 1917, a delegation of Social Democrats led by Ebert traveled to Stockholm for talks with socialists from other countries about a conference that could have ended the war based on a Vista currency and a Gunsfrieden without any annexions of territory. The initiative failed, however. In January 1918, when the workers in munition factories in Berlin went on strike, Ebert joined the strike leadership but worked hard to get the strikers back to work. He was pilloried from the left as a traitor to the working class, and from the right as a traitor to the fatherland. Revolution of 1918 Euro 19 equals Parliamentization equals, As the war continued, the military high command and in particular Erich Ludendorff, had become the de facto ruler of Germany. When it became clear that the war was lost in late summer and fall of 1918, Ludendorff started to favor the parliamentization of the empire, that is a transfer of power to those parties that held the majority in the Reichstag. The goal was to shift the blame for the military defeat from the OHL to the politicians of the majority parties. On September 29, 1918, Ludendorff suddenly informed Paul von Hintz, the German foreign minister, that the Western Front could collapse at any moment and that a ceasefire had to be negotiated without delay. However, he suggested that the request for the ceasefire should come from a new government, based on the Reichstag majority. In his view, a revolution from above was needed. Chancellor Georg von Hartling and Emperor Wilhelm II agreed, although the former resigned. Skederman and a majority of SPD deputies were opposed to joining a bankrupt enterprise, but Ebert convinced his party, arguing that we must throw ourselves into the breach, and it is our damned duty to do it. In early October, the emperor appointed a liberal, Prince Maximilian of Baden, as chancellor to lead peace negotiations with the Allies. The new government for the first time included ministers from the SPD, Philip Skederman and Gustav Bauer. The request for a ceasefire went out on October 4. On October 5, the government informed the German public about these events. However, there was then a delay, as the American President Wilson initially refused to agree to the ceasefire. His diplomatic notes seem to indicate that the changes to the German government were insufficient and the fact that Wilhelm II remained head of state was a particular obstacle. Ebert did not favor exchanging the monarchy for a republic, but like many others, he was worried about the danger of a socialist revolution a euro and this seemed to become more likely with every day that passed. On October 28, the constitution was changed to transfer power to the Reichstag. At this point, the majority parties of the Reichstag, including Ebert's SPD, were quite satisfied with the state of affairs a euro. What they now needed was a period of calm to deal with the issue of negotiating an armistice and a peace treaty. Equals November Revolution equals, however, on October 30, a confrontation between officers and crews on board the German fleet at Wilhelmshaven set in motion a train of events that would result in the German Revolution which spread over a substantial part of the country over the next week. Against the backdrop of a country falling into anarchy, the SPD led by Ebert on November 7 demanded a more powerful voice in the cabinet, an extension of parliamentarism to the state of Prussia and the renunciation of the throne by both the emperor and his oldest son, Wilhelm. Ebert had favored retaining the monarchy under a different ruler, but, if the Kaiser does not abdicate, the social revolution is inevitable. But I do not want it, 
I even hated Leipzig, he said to Max von Baden. On the left, the Spartacists and a group of around 80 to 100 popular labor leaders from Berlin known as Revolutionary Currency Reablut prepared for a revolution in the capital. On November 9, the revolution reached Berlin as the larger companies were hit by a general strike called by the Spartacists and the Ablut, but also supported by the SPD and the mainstream unions. Workers' and soldiers' councils were created and important buildings occupied. As the striking masses marched on the center of Berlin, the SPD, afraid of losing its influence on the revolution, announced that it was resigning from the government of Prince Max. Meanwhile, Prince Max failed to convince Emperor Wilhelm II, who was at the army headquarters at Spa at the time, of the need to abdicate. Wilhelm had resigned himself to the loss of the imperial crown, but still thought he could remain king of Prussia. When Max failed to convince him of the unreality of this belief, he unilaterally and untruthfully announced that Wilhelm had in fact abdicated and that the crown prince had agreed to relinquish his right of succession. Shortly thereafter the SPD leadership arrived at the Chancellery and Abert asked Prince Max to hand over the government to him. After a short meeting of the cabinet, the Chancellor resigned and, in an unconstitutional move, handed his office over to Abert, who thus became Chancellor of Germany and Minister-President of Prussia Euro the first socialist, the second politician and the second commoner to hold either office. Abert left the government of Prince Max mostly unchanged but appointed SPD minders for the Prussian Minister of War and for the military commander of the Berlin area. Ebert's first action as Chancellor was to issue a series of proclamations asking the people to remain calm, get off the streets and to restore peace and order. It fell to work. Ebert then had lunch with Skederman at the Reichstag and, when asked to do so, refused to speak to the masses gathered outside. Skederman, however, seized the chance. In hopes of forestalling whatever the communist leader Karl Liebknecht was telling his followers at the now former royal palace, Skederman proclaimed Germany a republic. A furious Ebert promptly reproached him, you have no right to proclaim the republic. By this he meant that the decision was to be left to an elected national assembly, even if that decision might be the restoration of the monarchy. Later that day, Ebert even asked Prince Max to stay on as regent but was refused. Since Wilhelm II had not actually abdicated on November 9, legally Germany remained a monarchy until the emperor signed his formal abdication on November 28. But when Wilhelm handed over supreme command of the army to Paul von Hindenburg and left for Holland on the morning of November 10, the country was effectively without a head of state. An entirely socialist provisional government based on workers' councils was about to take power under Robert's leadership. It was called Rat der Volksbof Trakten. Ebert found himself in a quandary. He had succeeded in bringing the SPD to power and he was now in a position to put into law social reforms and improve the lot of the working class. Yet as a result of the revolution, he and his party were forced to share power with those on the left whom he despised a Euro the Spartacists and the Independents. In the afternoon of November 9, he grudgingly asked the USPD to nominate three ministers for the future government. Yet that evening a group of several hundred followers of the revolutionary currency Reablut had occupied the Reichstag and were holding an impromptu debate. They called for the election of soldiers and workers' councils the next day with an eye to name a provisional government a Euro the Rat der Volksbof Trakten. In order to keep control of events and against his own anti-revolutionary convictions, Ebert decided that he needed to co-opt the workers' councils and thus a euro whilst the formal head of government a euro also become the leader of the revolution. On November 10, the SPD led by Ebert managed to ensure that a majority of the newly elected workers' and soldiers' councils came from among their own supporters. Meanwhile, the USPD agreed to work with him and share power in the Rat der Volksbof Trakten, the new revolutionary government. Ebert announced the pact between the two socialist parties to the assembled councils who were eager for a unified socialist front and approved the parity of three members each coming from SPD and USPD. Ebert and Haas for the USPD were to be the joint chairman. That same day, Ebert received a telephone call from OHL Chief of Staff Wilhelm Groener, who offered to cooperate with him. According to Groener, 
he promised to bear the loyalty of the military in exchange for some demands, fight against Bolshevism, an end to the system of soldiers and workers' councils, a national assembly and a return to a state of law and order. This initiated a regular communication between the Twoa Euro involving daily telephone conversations over a secret line, according to Groener. It became known as the Alberta Euro Groener Pact. Equals Council of the People's Deputies equals, in domestic policy, a number of social reforms were quickly introduced by the Council of the People's Deputies under Alberta's leadership, including unemployment benefits, the eight hour workday, universal suffrage for everyone over the age of 20, the right of farm hands to organize, and increases in workers' so euro unregistered trademark old age, sick and unemployment benefits. A decree of November 12, 1918 established the Reich Office for Economic Demobilization, with the purpose of carrying the German economy over to peace conditions. On November 22, 1918, a regulation was issued by the Reich Food Office for election to a Euro or a Peasants a Euro unregistered trademark and workers a Euro unregistered trademark councils a Euro which were subscribed to a Euro early be all agricultural associations a Euro on November 23, 1918. The Reich Office for Economic Demobilization issued 12 regulations which set forth rules governing duration of a working day, sick leaves, paid vacations, and other aspects of labor relations within the German economy. A decree of the Office for Economic Demobilization made on December 9, 1918 provided that the state governments should require the communes and communal unions to establish departments for general vocational guidance and for placement of apprentices. On 23 November 1918, an order was introduced prohibiting work in bakeries between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. In December 1918, the income limit for entitlement to health insurance coverage was raised from 2,500 to 5,000 mark. The right of free assembly and association, which was extended even to government workers and officials, was made universal, and all censorship was abolished. The Jesenjordnung was revoked, and all discriminatory laws against agricultural workers were removed. These discriminations were replaced by a provisional order on January 24, 1919 that provided various rights for agricultural workers. In addition, provisions for labor protection were restored, and a number of decrees were issued establishing freedom of the press, religious freedom, and freedom of speech, and amnesty of political prisoners. Protections for home workers were also improved, and housing provision was increased. A decree of December 23, 1918 regulated wage agreements, laying down that a wage agreement that had been concluded in any branch of employment between the competent trade union authority and the competent employer's a Euro unregistered trademark authority had absolute validity, meaning that no employer could enter into any other agreement of his own initiative. In addition, an organization of arbitral courts was set up to decide all disputes. A decree of January 4, 1919 compelled employers to reinstate their former laborers on demobilization, while measures were devised to safeguard workers from arbitrary dismissal. Workers who felt that they had been treated unfairly could appeal to an arbitration court, and in case of necessity the demobilization authorities had the power to determine who should be dismissed and who should be retained in employment. A government proclamation of December 1918 ordered farmers to re-employ returning soldiers a euro away at their former working place and to provide work for the unemployed, a euro while an important decree was issued that same month in support of Jugend Pflege. A settlement decree was issued by the government on 29 January 1919 a euro e concerning the acquisition of land for the settlement of workers on the land a euro and which foresaw a euro of possibility of expropriating estates over 100 hectares to facilitate settlement a euro however, only just over 500,000 hectares were freed by 1928, benefiting 2.4% of the farming population. In addition, Ebert's government got food supplies moving again, and issued various decrees related to civil aviation and firearm possession. Equals Civil War equals in the weeks following the creation of the Rat der Volksbefragten, Ebert and the leadership of the SPD sided with the conservative and even nationalistic forces of society against the forces of the revolution. They wanted to eliminate the challenge to the existing order posed by the workers' councils as soon as possible. 
yet the majority of those in the workers and soldiers councils viewed themselves as supporters of the government. It was only the Spartacists who wanted a dictatorship of the workers. Ebert and Groener worked out a program to restore order in Berlin by having army units returning from the Western Front move in and disarm all unofficial paramilitary forces from 10 to December 15. However, after the ten divisions had arrived, rather than remaining as a cohesive force they dispersed. On December 16, the Reichsrecurrency de Congress met in Berlin and set the date for elections to the National Assembly for January 19, 1919. However, it also passed a resolution which was aimed at ensuring that the military would be under the strict control of the civilian government, that is the Rat der Volksbefragten. It also called for a powerful position of the soldiers' councils vis-à-vis -vis the professional officer corps. This was unacceptable to the leaders of the military and the OHL began to establish volunteer regiments in the Berlin area. Fighting erupted on December 24 on the Schlossplatz in Berlin. On December 23, dissatisfied members of the Navy had occupied the Reichskornsleih and put the Volksbefragt under house arrest. Ebert had asked the OHL for help over the phone and troops assembled on the outskirts of the capital. During the night, Ebert then ordered these troops to attack, which they did in the morning of December 24. When the fighting stopped in the afternoon the Volksmarine Division held the field, but they returned to their barracks, ending the crisis. As a result of this event, which Karl Liebknecht called Ebert's Blutwein Act, the USPD members left the Rat der Volksbefragten on December 29. The next day, SPD members Gustav Nosk and Rudolf Wassel took their place and from that point on, government communiques were signed Reichsgerung instead of Rat der Volksbefragten. That same day, the Spartacists severed their remaining links with the USPD and set themselves up as Communistische Partei. The week of 5 to January 12, 1919 became known as Spartacus Wosh, but historians view this as a misnomer. The Spartacist uprising was more an attempt by the Berlin workers to regain what they thought had been won in the November Revolution and what they now seem to be in the process of losing. The trigger was a trivial event. The head of the Berlin police, a member of the USPD, refused to accept his dismissal. The USPD called for a demonstration of solidarity but was itself surprised by the reaction as hundreds of thousands, many of them armed, gathered in the city centre on January 5. They seized the newspapers and railway stations. Representatives from USPD and KPD decided to topple the Abert government. However, the next day, the gathered masses did not seize government buildings, as the expected support from the military had not materialized. Ebert started to negotiate with the leaders of the uprising but simultaneously prepared for military action. Nosk was made commander of the Freie Corps and Ebert worked to mobilize the regular armed forces of the Berlin area on the government side. From 9 to January 12 on Ebert's orders, regular forces and Freie Corps successfully and bloodily suppressed the uprising. President of Germany On February 11, 1919, Five days after the National Versammlung convened in Weimar, Ebert was elected as Provisional President of the German Republic. He remained in that position after the new constitution came into force and was sworn in as Reichsbrecurrency Sident on August 21, 1919. He was Germany's first ever democratically elected head of state, and was also the first commoner, the first socialist, the first civilian and the first person from a proletarian background to hold that position. In the whole time of the unified German Reich's existence from 1871 to 1945, Friedrich Ebert also was the only head of state who was unequivocally committed to democracy. One of Ebert's first tasks as president was to deal with the Treaty of Versailles. When the treaty's terms became public on May 7, it was cursed by Germans of all political shades as an onerous diktat, particularly because Germany had essentially been handed the treaty and told to sign without any negotiations. Ebert himself denounced the treaty as unrealizable and unbearable. However, Ebert was well aware of the possibility that Germany would not be in a position to reject the treaty. He believed that the Allies would invade Germany from the West if Germany refused to sign. To appease public opinion, he asked Hindenburg if the army was capable of holding out if the Allies renewed hostilities. 
he promised to urge rejection of the treaty if there was even the remote possibility that the army could make a stand. Hindenburg, with some prodding from Groener, notified Ebert that the army was not capable of resuming the war even on a limited scale. Ebert thus advised the National Assembly to approve the treaty, which it did by a large majority on July 9. To avoid an election campaign at a critical time on October 24, 1922 the Reichstag extended his term of office until June 25, 1925 with a qualified majority vote that changed the constitution. The government's fight against communist forces, as well as recalcitrant socialists, went on after Ebert became president. From January to May 1919, in some areas through the summer, civil war in Germany continued. Since the 19th January elections had returned a solid majority for the Democratic parties, Ebert felt that the revolutionary forces had no legitimacy whatsoever left. He and Osk now used the same forces they had earlier employed in Berlin on a national scale to dissolve the workers' councils and to restore law and order. In March 1920, during the right-wing caput of some Freikorps elements, the government, including Ebert, had to flee from Berlin. However, a refusal by civil servants to accept the self-declared government and a general strike called by the legitimate cabinet led to the collapse of the Putsch. After the end of the Putsch, striking workers in the Ruhr region refused to return to work and, led by members of the USPD and the KPD, presented an armed challenge to the authority of the government. It then sent Reichswundfrei Corps troops to quell the Ruhr uprising by force. As president, Ebert appointed centre-right figures like Wilhelm Kuno and Hans Luther as Chancellor and made rigorous use of his wide-ranging powers under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution. Through 1924, he used the presidency's emergency powers a total of 134 times. After the Civil War he changed his politics to a policy of balance between the left and the right, between the workers and the owners of business enterprises that he followed a policy of brittle coalitions. This resulted in some problems, such as the acceptance, during the crisis of 1923, by the SPD of longer working hours without extra compensation while the Conservative parties ultimately rejected the other element of the compromise, the introduction of special taxes for the rich. Death. Ebert suffered from gallstones and frequent bouts of cholecystitis. Vicious attacks by Ebert's right-wing adversaries, including slander and ridicule, were often condoned or even supported by the judiciary when the president turned to the courts. The constant necessity to defend himself against those attacks also undermined his health. In December 1924, a court in Magdeburg fined a journalist who had called Ebert a traitor to his country for his role in the January 1918 strike, but it also said that, legally, Ebert had in fact committed treason. This court case prevented him from seeking medical help for a while, as he wanted to be available to give evidence. He became acutely ill in mid-February 1925 from what was believed to be influenza. His condition deteriorated over the following two weeks, and at that time he was thought to be suffering from another episode of gallbladder disease. He became acutely septic on the night of February 23 and underwent an emergency appendectomy in the early hours of the following day for what turned out to be appendicitis. He died of septic shock four days later, aged 54. He was buried in Heidelberg. Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Ebert's policy of balancing the political factions during the Weimar Republic is seen as an important archetype in the SPD. Today, the SPD-associated Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Germany's largest and oldest party-affiliated foundation, which, among other things, promotes students of outstanding intellectual ability and personality, is named after Ebert. Controversy about the Freikorps collaboration, Ebert remains a controversial figure to this day. While the SPD recognizes him as one of the founders and keepers of German democracy whose death in office was a great loss. Others argue that he paved the way for National Socialism by supporting the Freikorps and their suppression of worker uprisings. Ebert effectively allied himself with forces that in truth considered the Republic tainted beyond redemption for being associated with the national humiliation of November 1918 and the Treaty of Versailles. They also failed to thank him for working with them and suppressing the more radical leftist groups. 
as a social democrat Ebert was considered to be the political enemy by conservative and nationalistic groups. They subsequently claimed that the German working class, supported by the SPD, was responsible for Germany's defeat in World War I. The alleged proof of this Dolch Stoigend was found in a number of strikes during 1917 and 1918 which had partly disrupted production in the Imperial German armaments industry. The aim of the striking workers and their socialist allies was said to have been to turn the German Empire into a Soviet Socialist Republic. In addition, it had been the majority parties of the Reichstag which formally asked for the ceasefire in October 1918 and it had been the civilian government rather than the military which represented Germany in the ceasefire negotiations of November 1918. Most historians, however, agree that military defeat was inevitable after the U.S. had joined the war against Germany. Some historians have defended Ebert's actions as unfortunate but inevitable of the creation of a socialist state on the model that had been promoted by Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht and the Communist Spartacists was to be prevented. Leftist historians like Bent Engelmann as well as mainstream ones like Sebastian Hafner on the other hand, have argued that organized communism was not yet politically relevant in Germany at the time. However, the actions of Ebert and his Minister of Defense, Gustav Norsk, against the insurgents contributed to the radicalization of the workers and to increasing support for communistic ideas. Although the Imar constitution provided for the establishment of workers' councils on different levels of society, they did not play a major part in the political life of the Imar Republic. Ebert always regarded the institutions of parliamentary democracy as a more legitimate expression of the will of the people. Workers' councils, as a product of the revolution, were only justified in exercising power for a transitive period. All power to all the people. Was the slogan of his party, in contrast to the slogan of the far left, all power to the councils. In Ebert's opinion only reforms, not a revolution, could advance the causes of democracy and socialism. He therefore has been called a traitor by leftists, who claim he paved the way for the ascendancy of the far right and even of Adolf Hitler, whereas those who think his policies were justified claim that he saved Germany from Bolshevik excesses. See also, Ebert Groener Pact, President Friedrich Ebert Memorial. References External links, German, President Friedrich Ebert Memorial in Heidelberg, Ebert, Friedrich. Collier's New Encyclopedia 1921. Works by Friedrich Ebert at LibriVox